Um, uh, again, last time I was here, we did speak about a topic uh, uh, close to this at SOAS, my, my, my, my old stomping grounds, um, but I can't remember the actual theme. But today, hopefully I get to talk to you a little bit about a, a new sort of extended work that I'm writing on, which is largely speculative, simply because it does ask the question of what does Turkey look like or what could possibly Turkey look like post the departure of President Tayyip Erdogan, who obviously has been in power uh, just under 20 years. Um, and so if you ask why we're looking at that, um, one simple answer is, well, this month is literally 20 years to the day or to the month since the Justice and Development Party, or the AKP, took over power uh, from the Democratic Left Party Coalition. And for most people in the room, I'm guessing that you would have no recollection of that, presumably because this is the first and only political leader that you kind of grew up under. <laughs> Um, which is actually surprising to me because it seems like yesterday. And so I'm also getting to, to, to a comfortable position of respecting my elders when they say to you, it's all going to pass in the blink of an eye, and it literally has been 19 years since I left the UK on a permanent basis. I keep on coming and forth, back and forwards, but 20 years is, is, is a long time. Um, so what, what are we looking at here? So the first thing I will say is this is President Erdogan's third attempt at, uh, at the office of the presidency, uh, that, he will, that he's seeking to be directly elected uh, by the public to get into. It is arguably the toughest electoral challenge he is also facing. Um, the first two times was relatively uncontested for various reasons, if no other than bad candidates. Um, but this time is likely to be the toughest, regardless of, of who, who stands up in front of him as his opponent. Um, and there are very re various reasons for this if, if you follow Turkey relatively closely or even at a distance. Um, domestically, the Turkish economy, regardless of your opinion of the AKP or, or, or Erdogan himself, is, is what I would call a dumpster fire. Um, if you thought inflation in the United Kingdom was high, and it certainly is, as it is in the United States, um, Turkey's official rate of inflation is running over 85% a year. That's the official figure. Unofficially, if you listen to... Uh, what I would call real economists, its consumer inflation is running closer to about 150% a year, um, which basically means to us, uh, if you're into vaguely into economics, um, the erosion or the elimination of the Turkish middle class. If you have family members there who, who, who until recently took foreign vacations that, uh, to places like Europe or the United States even, that is now a thing of the past if they earn their keep in Turkish lira because the, the currency, in addition to the inflationary pressures, has lost over 70% of its value in just 2021, 20, 2022 alone. In, it, no matter which way you spin this, it's an economic disaster if President Erdogan is, is seeking to become re-elected because most voters are looking for someone to blame. And for somebody who has been in power for approximately 20 years, that blame stops at the, at the chief executive of the country. Um, on top of that, obviously, for all Turks in Europe, people who follow Turkey closely, the country is extremely polarized. And I think that's something where many of you can empathize with simply because polarization is not endemic to places like Turkey, but everywhere in the world, not least of all the United States and the United Kingdom. But Turks are just very polarized on the very name and credentials of President Erdogan. You either love him or you absolutely abhor him. There is no middle ground, it seems. And you can get this from just a sense of, of, of following the news on Turkey daily, or dare I say, if you visit the, um, the sewer that is Twitter, uh, where people are at their worst form of behavior. Um, on the world stage also, Turkey is, is extremely isolated, um, marginalized, and I would also say less than trusted by its partners, allies in the European Union, member states of the EU, as well as the United States. Um, recently, Turkey is consistently uh, holding up Swedish and Finnish membership of NATO. And even if they make it in, uh, which they probably will, uh, one thing to bear in mind that there has been so much goodwill lost by the Swedish and Finnish governments that is shared by European governments that, unfortunately, Turkey's re ability to recover its relationship with these countries is going to be a really hard, pr a hard slog. Um, Turkey is suspected of being a close Russian ally, if not in name, but in practice. In 2019, it purchased uh, a Russian-made missile defense system, uh, which it, the United States and NATO members has pushed back very severely against, which has resulted 
for the first time in one NATO uh, member being sanctioned by another NATO member, the United States sanctions on, on Turkey's ability to acquire uh, weapons and materials, which has never happened before. NATO was designed and, implement, and, and constructed to thwart the so Soviet Union. It does not have muscle memory to thwart an internal member's ability to undermine it. So this is becoming extremely toxic, as or, it already is toxic. Um, it is also continuing to present quite an antagonistic stance as a country under Erdogan's personal uh, d uh, direction of, of, of, of heightened tensions in the Eastern Mediterranean and, and, and seemingly becoming threatening towards NATO and European Union members such as Greece and Cyprus uh, over, the, over the conflict over who owns what in terms of hydrocarbons and natural gas deposits. And finally, the U.S. is increasingly suspicious of Turkey for becoming a safe haven for uh, maintaining terrorists, mainly by insisting on uh, holding members of Hamas uh, and, and refusing to recognize the organization as a terrorist entity, uh, whilst it seeks to gain sympathy for the recent and tragic bombing uh, in Taksim Square. So um, this, these are just some of the domestic and foreign policy considerations that Erdogan is facing, which is making his life, I would say, considerably more difficult if he's standing a chance of, of, of, of re-election. So it has taken, I would say, uh, a considerable reputational toll on his, on his own persona. Um, you do not necessarily see him out in public, glad-handing, shaking hands of citizens or walking through uh, the markets, which he was able to do earlier on in his, in his tenure. But more than this, the country that he is seeking to gain re-election over, I would say, uh, is basically becoming ungovernable. And what I mean by that uh, is based on the presidential system that became into operation as of 2017, what he calls the presidential, Turkish presidential style of government, um, Turkey was designed from the outset to be a parliamentary democracy. It has no experience with a strong presidential executive. The fact that this has become inaugurated in the last four years uh, and the elimination of cabinet responsibility for ministerial positions means that the presidency is the first and last stop, essentially, of all matters of political responsibility. The fact that that concentration of power has occurred means that most pressing issues from the economy to European relations to, to relations with... Um, uh, other partners and allies, not least of all NATO, is being micromanaged. Suffice it to say, how much can one man pay attention to? Um, and so you, you literally have a one-person show uh, trying to govern the country. Furthermore, the rule of law in Turkey can arguably, well, not arguably, I would say is being completely compromised at this point. The courts have ceased to function as entities where impartial justice is rendered. To be fair, prior to Erdogan, the rule of law or, or, or the supremacy of the rule of law was not perfect, but it is not what we see today. Um, but the most difficult thing I would say that Erdogan faces in being re-elected is the new electoral system that has gone into place as part and parcel of this new presidential system. Right? If he is to be re-elected as president, he literally needs 50% of the popular vote plus one. Right? Uh, that is extremely hard to attain. Prior to becoming president, he could rely on not having an absolute parliamentary majority in terms of the percentage of votes the AKP received, but nevertheless, that could translate into the majority of seats in parliament for him to form a governing uh, cabinet. The mere fact that he does have to gain 50% of the vote plus one um, is, is, is, is, is, is, is more than a gargantuan or, or a Herculean task at this point, given the, the factors I've just outlined. Um, finally, I would say you've got the politicization of the economy, which is not helping him. Unlike the rest of the world, uh, you know, if you do hate high interest rates, you should probably think of moving to Turkey because the Turkish Central Bank has been cutting the interest rates down from just this year from a high of 16% in 2022, now down to, I think the benchmark is now 10.5%. Uh, which is great if you are a small and medium-sized business uh, that requires uh, uh, a cheaper credit to keep the taps on, right? So you can actually keep on doing business and manufacturing. But it is taking a negative consequence on just the average citizen because that is taking a toll on the rate of the currency, uh, whereby Turks are essentially uh, becoming impoverished day by day. Uh, so just this, the notion that lack of central bank independence and the politicization of economic decision-making uh, by the president is unfortunately 
uh, uh, taking its toll, and I don't know how, how you stop it until you get back to a conventional sense of, of or, or, or, or doctrinal economic policies, as, as some people call it. So who stands against him? And what happens if President Erdogan loses power? Well, the first point I will make is it depends who's going to face off against him. Right? Who is his, going, who is his opponent going to be? I'll save that for a couple of minutes down the line, but let's just look at the general sort of opposition scene in terms of, of, of, of what they are facing. So right now, all the opposition parties in Turkey, well, not all of them, actually, um, the majority of opposition political parties in Turkey, except for the Kurds, uh, have coalesced and come together under a, a, an umbrella referred to as the Nation Alliance of six political parties, right? Um, and this was established by the Republican People's Party, the main opposition party in parliament, as an umbrella. Um, and what do we know about what they stand for? What, what we do know is they haven't declared a formal candidate yet. Now, there have been, been a number of names floating around, and it looks like, the, uh, up until recently, I was pretty set on the notion that the leader of the CHP, the Republican People's Party, Kemal Kılıç Daroğlu, was going to be the front runner. If you follow the news, he's pretty much left, right, and center in public appearances. He's all, all but been named the candidate. He visited Washington. He's recently been to London, I saw, uh, but I'm not quite sure what the purpose of those visits have been. Uh, in his Washington visit, he really didn't really get up to much in terms of meeting with any senior officials or any government official for that matter. Instead, he met with students, tech companies, and I think just shook hands. Um, and I'm not sure what, what, what, what the, the, the outcome of that was. Um, the other two popular candidates that were deemed to be front runners uh, were seen to be one, the mayor of Ankara, uh, Mansur Yavash. Um, although he seems to have sort of slipped by the wayside, he doesn't seem to be gearing up for this. But a more likely name is making increasing, getting in pressures from the base of the party, uh, from, the, from, the, from the base of the CHP itself, is the current mayor of Istanbul, uh, Ekrem Imamoğlu, uh, who seems to be quite a, a, a, a, an interesting person. More about him in a little while. But beyond that, we don't know what the National Alliance stands for. Right? And I say this because just harken back to make most people here are not old enough to remember this. <laughs> uh, back in 2001, 2002, when Turkey literally was facing the worst economic crisis of modern times, right, Tayyip Erdogan and the AKP looked like they were ready to assume power. What do we mean by that? Well, they had a real national presence. They engaged with the mass media. Uh, they literally had an electoral platform. They published something referred to as the emergency action plan in terms of what they sought to accomplish in the first 100 days if they got into power, which they started checking off when they did come into power, actually. Right? Um, they uh, toured Washington, although they, they deny this, but they actually met with senior government, U.S. officials, the president at the time, um, and also European officials. They had a presence in terms of policy platforms as well as uh, letting the world know that they were ready and had, and, and, and had a plan for Turkey should they took office. The Nation Alliance doesn't have this. And how do we know they don't have this? Well, because we don't know what they stand for. The only thing that I've seen that they've put forward in terms of what they seek to accomplish if their main candidate, again, we don't know who it is, if they get into power, is they're going to return Turkey back to being a strengthened parliamentary democracy. Okay? And it's not nothing, but it's... They've also sort of mumbled a few things about the fact that they would actually reestablish the rule of law and mend ties with partners and allies, as well as uh, go back to um, economic orthodoxy uh, so as to rebuild the Turkish economy. So that's what they've said. If we were to speculate about, speculate about what they need to achieve on top of that, if they should assume power... I, I, I think it's a, huge, it's a huge lift operation. It's not, if, if you are a believer and subscriber to the view that Tayyip Erdogan has caused immeasurable harm to the country, both in its rule of law and economic management in the last, let's say, last five, six years, then the task really is gargantuan. Rebuilding the country's judiciary away from partisan judges and prosecutors will be quite a mammoth task. Uh, the entire civil service, unfortunately, at this point, has moved away 
at least in the last decade, from being appointed by, uh, from, from a meritocracy, basically to appointing loyalists into just about every position uh, that we've seen. Um, this can really be seen at, at the level of foreign, foreign sort of appointments to, to, to embassies and consulates across the world, uh, not least of all Washington, D.C. Uh, notions of law enforcement, military, will have to be completely overhauled in terms of just moving away from folks who are just loyalists to being essentially having an established process of a meritocracy in terms of a sane appointment system. Uh, the re-establishment of associational and press and individual freedoms will have to get a complete makeover as these are completely absent in Turkey at this point of time. Uh, I'll touch upon the media scene in just a little while, but just gives you a certain sort of sense of what's going on. So whatever that happens, um, whoever takes over power from Erdogan, if it's next year or if it's some undefined point in time, um, it will be a, quite a, a, a gigantic uh, a sort of recipe to, to overcome. So what, op- what chances does the opposition or the nation alliance have? Well, we did say it would, depends on who they appoint. So it might, at this point, my, my guess is it's either going to be Kemal Kılıç or, or, or Ekrem İmamoğlu who, who will essentially be uh, the candidate. If it's Kılıç who is the presidential candidate to, to face off against Erdogan, if you take Turkish polling companies or several of them which are considered to be reputable to, to, and, and hold that as your sort of source of data, right, um, then I would say Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu is the weakest link in, in, in beating Erdogan. Um, if he is to have any chance of beating Erdogan in the first v- round of voting, 50% plus one, this is, where, this is where it needs to happen. But it is also this, the, the, the, the, the sort of the area where Kılıçdaroğlu is weakest against in comparison to Ekrem İmamoğlu. So if you look at these polls, what you see is there is no sort of gray area here in that sense, whereby Emamolu is the front runner in, in terms of electability to stand against Erdogan. If he does become the candidate, uh, he has a higher chance of taking out Erdogan in the first round. And if he doesn't succeed in the first round, it looks like he does have an even greater chance of beating Erdogan in the second round. Now, these polls shift, and Erdogan has made some ground in the last few weeks, right? But just the notion of who the candidate is mat- it matters, but... Just on face value, someone like Imamoglu is much more uh, has much more of a presence than Kılıç Darulu. Kılıç Darulu has been in power as the chairman of the CHP since 2010. He is a nice person. I think uh, he's presented an, on, an air of honesty, respectability, and gained regained the sense of uh, gravitas for the chairman of the CHP since his predecessor, Deniz Baikal. But that being said, he is also quite a tarnished political actor in the last uh, 10 to 12 years, just having been in opposition to Erdogan. I think most voters do feel a sense that he cannot win against Erdogan. But also, there is some notion that he really doesn't have anything. To, he's not very much tied in or connected to what needs to happen in terms of a platform, both economic and political, to get Turkey back to a post-Erdogan phase. Imamoglu, on the other hand, and, and, and I should just make this clear, I'm not advocating for a candidate here. I, I honestly don't have any pull in the game. Uh, I'm just interested in analysis here. Uh, what it does seem to be, if you look at Imamoglu, he seems to have quite a national presence, and that is part and parcel of both being mayor of Istanbul, but also how he comports himself politically, right? Um, the one thing that really caught people's attention was during this summer gone, when Imam Oğlu went on a tour of the Black Sea. And you may think, well, that's part of that's great. He, you know, the mayor of Istanbul tours the Black Sea. That's great. So what? Well, the so what is President Erdogan is also from the Black Sea, specifically from the town of Rize. For Imam Oğlu to go and campaign and just put himself out there as a sort of candidate or a sort of candidate in waiting, but just shake hands and talk to marketeers, shopkeepers, and just generally engage with people, kissing old ladies... Um, that was a shot across the bow to suggest that he really does have the goal to basically stand up Erdogan in his home turf. And he seems to have basically gone over pretty well in the sense that people did respond to him quite positively in, in, in, in, in, in, in the Black Sea region. But more importantly, uh, many look to Imam Oğlu as being type Erdogan's worst nightmare if he is to face against him in, in a presidential election. And the reason for that is quite simple. Uh, 
And the reason is basically Imam Oulu has faced off Erdogan indirectly when he was running to become mayor of Istanbul. If you go back to the local elections, 2019, I believe, it was 2019? Everything's a blur now, so many elections. 2019, the municipal elections, Imam Oulu won the Istanbul race in the first round. He just won the race, which essentially uh, angered Erdogan and resulting in the annulment of the Istanbul election. And, the real, and, and, and three months later, a new election was called in Istanbul again. Right? This time around, Imam Oulu not only won again, but the margin of his victory was even greater. Right? This is what gives Imam Oulu confidence to run against Erdogan. This is why the base of the CHP is pushing increasingly more towards running Imam Oulu against Erdogan, because he is young, he is charismatic, he seems to have the presence uh, and the ability to face a campaign, right, uh, whereby he can keep his cool and where he can actually uh, uh, uh, give Erdogan a run for his money. And, and let's be honest here. President Erdogan, if no other reason, if you don't like him, whatever, that's your own personal opinion, Erdogan, if, for no other reason, is an, is an election machine, right? He can run elections. He's extremely experienced in this. Uh, he's extremely good at it. He's extremely good at campaigning. Uh, so what he's running up against... Uh, Imam Ol, if he is the candidate, will be a considerable machine. Um, what other factors besides the candidates do, does, the, um, the, does the alliance face? Well, I think the biggest problem, other than not having a platform on what they stand for, right, um, is... I don't believe in the sincerity of Kovic Tharoglu and the rest of the candidates that are squabbling or seem to be squabbling for who the nominee is going to be. What I mean by that is I do not think they're interested in giving up the presidency or returning Turkey back to a parliamentary democracy. Kovic Tharoglu and the Panation Alliance has been banging on about the fact that their intention is to return Turkey back to a parliamentary democracy. Okay, that's great. So by definition, therefore, whoever you elect as president... Right, this all-powerful president should essentially be not that interesting or important. You shouldn't, they should not be giving that much credence to who becomes president if they are seeking to abolish that powerful office back to a ceremonial role. So why are they squabbling over it? It doesn't make sense to me. I think the problem with the Nation Alliance is they are really pushing for, especially College Thrall, to take over the presidency, not to get away, get away from it anytime soon, but use the powers of that office for what they define to be, for benevolent reasons, but I do not think that their intention is to actually move away from it. That is speculation on my part, but it's logical reasoning. Why go after something so badly if your intention is not to necessarily just make use of it once you get there and return the country back to a parliamentary system? Um, the, other thing, the other two things is, again, they don't look like they're ready to take power in terms of platforms and pamphlets. But the other thing is they really haven't given voters a reason for vote for them. If your entire platform is... The economy's terrible. Erdogan's a bad man, right? Well, what, what do you have? You know, it's, you know, protest movements often fail, right? So take Gezi, for example. You know, it's all very well going out in the streets protesting and saying, you know, anti you know taking an anti-government position, that's great. But what do you stand for? And this is one of the reasons why Erdogan was able to pick off the Gezi protest movement so effectively, simply because you pinched at the edges, take out a few of its ringleaders, prosecute them, jail them, whilst the platform itself or the Gezi platform has no leadership, it has no program beyond just protesting. Unfortunately, this is one of my sort of suspicions for the actual Nation Alliance. Other than the fact that they stand against Erdogan, we don't know what they stand for. So which brings me to the final part of this talk, which is what are we likely to see? What are the chances of an Erdogan defeat at the next upcoming presidential election sometime on or just before June 2023? Well, I'll start by saying, you know, whether it's the, the US model or even the UK model, but generally an incumbent, just by seemingly being the incumbent, has the advantage of being an incumbent, right? Even under normal circumstances where you have a full functioning, fully functioning democracy or democratic government, an incumbent has huge advantage. Why? 
Well, they have presence, they have title, they have visibility in the press, they have you know, the, the control of the government, right? In the US, just the mere fact of the president going to a campaign and landing on, with Air Force One on an airstrip, that commands a, quite, a, quite a large amount of presence, which an opposition candidate does not have advantage of, take advantage of, right? So you have name recognition, visibility, and resources, right? And Erdogan has plenty of that, and I've already mentioned that he's what has been referred to as an election machine. He's extremely capable, experienced, right? And has won many elections, whether you think they have been justly won or otherwise, right? Beyond the weaknesses of the, of the Nation Alliance, uh, I would also sort of break up the tactics that Erdogan can and will resort to into two camps. One is absolutely legitimate and game, and the others may not be so. So what do I mean by legitimate and game sort of tactics? Well, there's been this considerable sort of amount of talk in the Turkish press or the mainstream press suggesting that Erdogan will just spend his way out of an election, turn on the monetary taps, bump up civil service pay. And as he's recently just announced that all contract staff in the civil service will be made permanent civil service employees. Uh, now, credit, uh, the credit taps have been open, re opened up for small businesses and medium-sized businesses, like really below interest rates. Pensions, uh, bonuses, etc., for for civil and retirees is, have already been announced, right? And people say, well, he's just turning on the monetary taps. Well, I have news for everybody. That's game. That's what an incumbent can and do. You may think it's it's imprudent. You may think that's populist. I agree with you. I don't have yes, but that's what incumbents do. They spend, right? And and he is likely to do that more and more as as the days go past up until the elections come. What's the opposition's policy? We don't know. They don't have one. Um, so that's one thing. Two, this lies on the border of this package. The, the, the relative access of information that voters have in Turkey to, to candidates in the political field. This is possibly one of the, most, one of the weakest sort of uh, elements of the opposition. The mainstream press is unfortunately quote-unquote, just pro Erdogan. Ninety percent of the airwaves and the print press is uncontrollably in the hands of Erdogan. If Don't take my say-so. You can op typically just go online any given day, whereby one newspaper, one, one new, main newspaper's headline will be shared by 15 others, verbatim, even the actual article that goes with it. Most of the mainstream press, such as the Doğan Group, uh, uh, have been sold to pro Erdogan entities especially since the 2016 coup attempt. Uh, add on to this, this new law that was passed by Parliament, referred to as the disinformation law, uh, which in common parlance has been referred to as the uh, censorship law, has come into operation, whereby the government has the right and ability to ask uh, representatives of the government to talk to any media platform, be it social media or conventional media, to remove content. That's deemed, that's deemed to be divisive and insightful of hatred, right? Translate that into normal English, it means they can remove any content from any media. They can actually detain, arrest, and jail any person that they deem to be inciting violence or hatred, i.e. any dissident or protester, and also has the knock-on effect of increasing the number of self-censorship that occurs amongst journalists, analysts, or whatever. So... That in itself, just the lack of free and fair information that's been accessed uh, is, is one thing. But also, let's not remember, in the last two elections, the amount of airtime that opposition candidates got in comparison to the AKP on state channels was uh, incomparable. I think the CHP received less than 3% coverage by the mainstream press, right? And if you ask, well, what does that matter? Because do people watch TV in Turkey? 90% of the people in Turkey get their information from TV. The print press is virtually irrelevant at this point. 90% get it from television. Uh, social media is only interesting to people if they're critical or essentially just sort of wanting to see alternate or real sources uh, or more credible sources of information, if, if that's a thing anymore. Now to the less sort of savory aspects of this. Um, what could happen? Well, the, the supreme body which governs elections, or the person, the, the body which declares who the winner is in Turkey, the, the High Electoral Council, the YSK, Yüksek Seçim Kurulu, is 100% uh, staffed by Erdogan loyalists. This, this, 
this is not different from any other government agency in Turkey in, in the last five, six years especially. But the YSK is, the, is, is one of the most critical ones at this point. If you have a question, if you differ with the results, or if, if, if you want to bicker with the, of, a, of, of, of, of an electoral outcome of any precinct, the YSK is the first and last stop of, of arbitration. You can take it to court, presumably, but again, the courts are essentially just filled with pro Erdogan people. So at that point, um, judicial overcourse, right, the right or your ability to appeal decisions uh, is, is, is, is, is largely gone. Last time what happened, uh, in the last national elections that happened, uh, that people are very suspicious of, and it's not magic or science, right, um, Erdogan declared victory before all the vote tallies were in. Uh, we've also seen this sort of tactic now play out in places like the United States. Uh, candidates declaring victory before the official count is in, which is why election observers and party officials are screaming at their uh, ballot box monitors to stay by the ballot box until every vote is counted and the piece of paper that's sent to the YSK is signed by everybody so the official tabulated result is not in question. Most people, after they hear the victory speech by Erdogan in certain precincts, and a lot of precincts just think, well, the game's over, I don't care anymore, I don't need to be here because it's going to be another two hours until all tallies that votes are tallied. If you're looking at a vote percentage in Turkey where the decision's going to be decided between one or two percent between two candidates, it's going to come down to how many precincts essentially did not stick around for all the ballots to be counted and signed so that if a malign actor wanted to fabricate a result, they can do so without any objection. This is where the problem lies. Ballot box interference or whatever is not a, it's not a mystery. It's not people in Ankara magically tabulating numbers at the YSK. It is people deserting ballot boxes. So if it's within a point of percent, you know, if, if the two candidates are within a percentage of with each other, this is where it counts. Voter intimidation at the ballot boxes, we really haven't seen a lot of this in Turkey. Uh, you know, actually people threatening to, to cause physical or whatever kind of harm to voters. We haven't seen that yet, but I'm just going to put that to one side. It, if Imam Oğur is nominated as the candidate, the, the one big problem that he faces is a lawsuit. Right? It, is, it is right now sitting on ice. The prosecutor has asked for his banning from politics. The prosecutor has asked for him to be essentially removed as mayor of Istanbul for basically just bogus charges, right? Kind of the same thing that Tayyip Erdogan faced um, after his incarceration and in imprisonment, which he had to basically override by a new court order so that it, allowed, that it could allow him to be re-elected elected as MP from Sinop in 2003 to become prime minister. But this could be one strategy why the, the opposition is not naming the candidate. If it is going to be Imam Olu, they would possibly want to wait until the last minute, simply because if he is the named candidate, it's harder for them. Well, it's not impossible, but it makes it that much harder. The optics look that much stranger if you then incarcerate a man who is going to be the main challenger to Erdogan. It's, it's just going to look bad, right? Um, so if it's Kılıçdaroğlu, then I would, my, my, my, my inclination is to say that, that between Imam Oğlu and Kılıçdaroğlu, Kılıçdaroğlu is the one chance that Erdogan probably stands the best chance of winning against and the, the less, least chance, that, the least necessity for him to roll out some of this election, election chicanery, right? I think Kılıçdaroğlu will be a less capable candidate um, and, and, and, and, and will have much less of a campaign presence than Imam Oğlu. Um, other than that, it will largely be left up to media sources in terms of who has access to what. But Imam Oğlu, I think at this point will probably have the largest uh, chance of succeeding. I'm going to stop there and hopefully field as much questions that you have for me. Thank you. Well, that's great. Thanks very much. <laughs> I'm going to have to go, um, but I just want to ask one question. Um, if uh, Erdogan loses, what should foreign policy, particularly in the region and with Europe, will be of the other candidates? Yeah, that's a good question. Again, we haven't heard anything official from what the foreign policy platform of, of, of, of the, um, the alliance will be. But they seem to be echoing and suggesting because one of the main candidate, one of the main members of the alliance is Ahmed Davutoglu, the former foreign minister and prime minister of Turkey. Presumably, he will have some ideas. 
uh, but I think you know one of the things they've sort of hinted at is that Turkey will have to re re-engage quite substantially in, in mending ties with its Western partners and allies so as to have a new equilibrium because they will need to secure credit and goodwill not just from Europe but also from, from, from, from, from the US end of this too. But we haven't had too much about this. So then that was an excellent uh, speech. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you for having and me. I'm sure there will be lots of interesting questions. I'm so sorry I have to leave you. I have a very pressing point I have to go to now. But um, I'd very much like to continue this uh, conversation further. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm sure there will be lots of questions uh, that will be taken forward. So, okay. uh, thank, thank you very much. much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going to slightly abuse my position as chair and ask a couple of questions. Um, let me just say, whenever I'm asked to present or write something that's a bit speculative, I'm very wary and sceptical about whether it's a good idea. I mean, I'm like predicting the future. I thought Sinan's talk was a model of how to do it. <laughs> um, I mean, it was great. All the options were there. All the possibilities were there. It was very structured. It was substantive when I was worried that, as it was going to be speculative, it might not be, but actually it was very substantive. I really enjoyed it, so Thank I think you. That, was, that was an excellent talk. Um, I've got two questions. The first one, sort of comments and questions. The first one I'm quite confident about, I think. The second one a bit less so, so the second one is a little bit um, top of my head. Uh, if I can beat my own drum, back in 2015, I put an article in International Affairs that was called something like... Turkey, a NATO ally, no more. Um, yeah, it was 2015. We've been talking about Turkey as, and its relationship with the Western Alliance for quite a long time. Um, but you made a comment about Turkey being isolated, and I just wondered whether this is a slightly Western-centric view. Um, you know, even if you look at something like Ukraine, the rest of the world, if you look at the UN vote, doesn't necessarily back the Western position on Russia and Ukraine. So if you look at Turkey, and not only Turkey, there is this view in Turkey that we've moved towards a more, or are moving towards a more multipolar world um, that is less Western-centric and has less need and less desire to follow the Western leadership. So China, obviously Russia, uh, India, all see themselves as independent actors, even though they have varying degrees of relationship with the West. They don't see the need to follow the West. And I think Turkey, at least under Erdogan, under the AKP, puts itself in that category of countries. It happens to be largely for legacy reasons a NATO ally, but it's part of this non-Western world that sees itself as part of a multipolar development. And if you look at the details of current Turkish foreign policy, there are overtures all over the place, um, towards Israel, towards Saudi Arabia, uh, and so on, and this idea that they're somehow neutral intermediary between Russia and Ukraine. So I don't know if it'll work for Turkey, but I just just want to ask you, you know, when you say Turkey is isolated, did you mean just from the West, or how far would you take that <coughs> observation? My second sort of comment question is about the domestic policy. I mean, we've got, what, seven or eight months, whatever it is, until the election takes place. I wonder how reasonable it is to expect this very awkward coalition, the Milliet of the National Alliance, to put together a hard and fast platform at, at this distance from an election. There are things that I think they all support, um, at least rhetorically. Parliamentary, return to parliamentary preeminence, um, you know, more uh, conventional orthodox management of the economy, certainly a rebalancing or reshifting back towards the Western alliance, um, independence of institutions, um, which, as you say, quite rightly, have become pretty much under Erdogan. It's not even AKP, it's Erdogan control, um, you know, sort of presidential office. Um, and I wonder if they need to, at this point in stage, be more detailed than that in their policy. When you talked about candidates, there's a problem with him, Amora, and I agree with everything you said, but there's a problem with him. At the other end of this alliance is um, Meryl Axner's EU party, which is quite nationalistic and uh, 
quite militant on the PKK YPG CODIS issue. And I wonder if Imamolu might, which he did in Istanbul, try to appeal towards the Kurdish vote. He might do that on, on a national basis, try to bring the HDP in as an active or passive member of this coalition. And whether that might fragment the coalition, whether Imamolu is too much on one part of the spectrum of the coalition and might divide it. I mean, it's a, as I say, I'm not confident about that question, but I do wonder if that could be the issue and Imamolu, Imamolu might be the agent by which the coalition fragments. Um, so those are my two questions, comments, and I promise after this, after Simmons responded, we'll throw it open to the floor. Okay. So let me see what I can do. Um, so I'll take the second question first. Um, you're right, whoever, whoever ends up being the candidate, they do have this pressing issue of what to do with the Kurds. And the reason why that is, because right now, I think the only space for where you're competing for votes in Turkey are quote-unquote undecided voters. So if an election happened tomorrow, my guess is Erdogan probably has somewhere between a vote base of about 30 to 40 percent. Just starting out. Yeah. And the opposition, whoever the candidate is, probably has something close to the you know, same. So you're looking at somewhere about trying to attract 10 to 20 percent of votes up and, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the playing field. Everyone else is ideologically committed, right? Um, so not declaring a platform at this point in time, it only makes sense to me if you are trying to buy time so that your front-leading candidate doesn't get banged up in prison. If they do that now, you go, you know, they, they can take measures against this person to delegitimize them, to call them that names, try and expose them, just like, you know, take their name through the ringer of the, of the pro Erdogan press, right? And that can be quite damaging to any candidate. Um, but this whole notion of the HTP and the Kurds, right? This is what I get really frustrated with, with, with the alliance about, you know, the calculation is, well, we don't want to shatter or, or, or, or essentially fragment the coalition by basically, you know, bringing the HDP to the table because they want, we don't want to be branded as, quote, terrorists, right? Or like being engaging with, with the HDP that supports or is in, you know, affiliated with the PKK. Okay, well, what's your job then? If you are members of parliament or in seeking national office and you cannot have a discussion and defy Erdogan's sort of presence of labeling everybody as terrorists, and say, I'm going to sit down and sort of talk with the Kurds, and the HTP should be at my base, right? Who else is going to do it? Me? My grandma? I mean, this is really frustrating, because the Kurds and the block of votes they carry are kingmakers. Without the HTP and the Kurdish vote, nobody becomes president. Um, you know, that, that's, you know, the, the HTP can account for somewhere between 10 to 15 percent of the vote. That's just behind the CHP. Every other party in that alliance is insignificant. Meryl Akshaners, okay, she has, you know, my, my suggestion would be to her, we'll just follow along. If you want, if you want to be a member of the new government, if you want any chance of being, because the, the, the E party's votes, sure, it's not insignificant, but compared to the HDP, this is the one thing they should really coalesce behind as an opposition sort of alliance. Forget about the name calling, take Erdogan head on, this is as politically and as economically weak as he's going to get. You might as well take a stance and let him do his worst. Otherwise, if you're not going to stand up and actually put forward your strongest foot and sort of dilly around the edges of, well, we might label this a terrorist for talking to the HTP, you might as well not do anything at this point. So that, that, that would be my answer to that one. With the foreign policy one in terms of, like, what do I mean by Turkey being isolated? Sure, I mean... Yes, Turkey is increasingly isolated and otherized and marginalized in the eyes of the West, i.e. The, the NATO bloc, the United States, and Europe, right, um, for, for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, that may not matter in some... Another adjective that you can use in, in, in, instead of isolated is, is, is unpredictable, right? So one of the things that the AKP prided itself on, you know, throughout most of its tenure of power, which was, you know... Uh, a constructive foreign policy that engaged positively, not just with its traditional partners and allies, but essentially alliance building and sort of furthering its reaches into the Middle East, which its sort of predecessors governments had not ventured out into. Just its opening to the Middle East 
in the early 2010s or late 2000s, right, until the Arab uprisings, I should say, right, Turkey's share of, you know, foreign trade uh, exploded with uh, new, newly built ties with places like Syria, the Arab world, it just massive opportunities cropped up for Turkey. But most of those have been squandered by diplomatic spats that has, that has been completely of Erdogan's making, I would argue, uh, whether it's falling out with Israel um, or, or I can't do much about Syria, <laughs> uh, uh, uh, uh, but also causing tips with the Iraqi government, uh, falling out and then coming back to in, in line with the Saudis and now falling out again. Um, this unpredictability in the realm of foreign policy is Tur costing Turkey, not just reputationally, but just monetarily too. Just look at levels of foreign direct investment that comes in Turkey. It's fallen to z for zero levels just about at this point. Uh, Volkswagen, which was supposed to build a factory, a plant in Turkey, a billion and a half euros of investment, just said, uh, we're not, this, is too, this is too hot for us. Um, we're just going to go somewhere else. So... It's costing Turkey, um, but also in, in just defense and security cooperation, too. I think this whole business in the Eastern Mediterranean, regardless of your views, just this antagonistic stance and militarization of the Eastern Mediterranean, even if I believe that Turkey actually has a point over uh, territorial waters. I've always thought Turkey has a right in terms of that. Like, you cannot just willy-nilly uh, implement unclose in the Eastern Mediterranean. Turkey can actually n litigate this sensibly. But when you send naval ships threatening to gun down over or saying, I don't recognize Crete as part of Greece's sovereign you know, economic zone, I'm like, that is not reality. You, you, you cannot function in, the, in, in, you know, in, in this space with that kind of attitude because that puts you in the league with regimes like Iran. You're just not recognizing that that, that does not work, right? Um, and that, any hydrocarbons... That, that are discovered there, or Turkey wants to become an energy hub, this and that, that requires international investors from looking at this and saying, there needs to be stability here. For it, that to be monetized and effectively just, you know, uh, uh, made a reality, then these, these, these, these disputes have to be resolved. And so this unpredictable and, and antagonistic sort of presence in the foreign policy realm, which we're not accustomed to uh, prior to, I would say, 2010, Right, is really costing Turkey reputationally, but also economically. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Over to the floor. Um, there's a number of hands. I'm going to take, let me take three, and I'll ask Sinan to deal with them oh, right. um, economically rather than yeah, yeah. loquaciously. And there was one there, there's one there, and there was one that I put back over there. So we'll go Eva. Uh, hi, my name is Sinan Wilson. I'm the London representative for the 501 Gaming Show, CNN 30. Uh, I want to ask two questions, if I'm allowed to be greedy here. Be quick um, about them, but yes. <laughs> so my first question is, um, I mean, thank you so much for this uh, very accurate explanation. Can you stand up, please? Because we cannot sure. see you, please. Yeah, so thank you so much for the accurate explanation of what's uh, happening currently in Turkey. Um, I, I find it very accurate, so it's very um, balanced as well. But my question is, what is your diagnosis for the, uh, for the opposition? And um, as you said, there's like a really strong polarization and the tensions are high. But for some reason, the other side is not as coherent as we wish or other people would wish them to, or as an as a, as a observer to wish them to, because that would be a healthy democracy. But it looks like one side is very coherent in what they want, what they think, what, is, what their ideology is, and the other side is all fragmented. And if it's that polarized, well, how comes that the opposition is so influenced that we don't understand? what they stand for, what they want, and what, what are they promising. My second question is, um, what is your thought on uh, President Erdogan's portrayal on the Western media as a Islamist leader? I mean, I, um, this, is, this is like a really ongoing thing on the Western media. It's been repeated a lot of times, but we don't really know what that means. So what is your thought on Erdogan's Islamism? And my third question is about, I mean, I don't know if I missed it, but um, if it's chronological explanation of what's happening in Turkey, I think we missed out two attempts. And what are your thoughts on that two attempts? And, how, and I think part of the reason why we're in this, as you said, toxic political situation in Turkey, I think it's, it is part of the reason why we're in this situation in Turkey. And um, how do you think we can get out of that situation considering there has been a clear attempt and it is still not quite clear what happened and 
uh, who's behind it. So, um, so those three questions. Please. Thanks very much. Um, just before you respond and we go to the other two, um, I'm, I've been very indulgent, allowed somebody three questions. From now on, you can only have one question each. <laughs> um, and if the other two that I will come back to don't mind, we'll deal with these three questions and, and you two are next, okay? So, and by the way, it would be nice if you're happy to do so to tell us who you are, you know, half sentence. Um, I think it was you next, was it? Yes. Oh, sorry, you, you're going to answer this lady first. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then I'll come back. Uh, the first part of your question, why is, if it's polarized, why it's... Uh, the only explanation I can offer is they're squabbling over positions. I mean, they're divvying up... The, they're seeming in the process of divvying up who's going to get what when, when they win the election. I mean, this is... If you talk just with, like, parties sort of represent... Or people who gravitate around the CHP or the back ends of Ankara, sort of people who understand and have connections to the political parties themselves... What I'm hearing is that they're all squabbling over, well, who gets what position? and what, It's just a divvying up of spoils at this point. This is the major problem with the alliance. Just behind the facade, right, is, is, is, is this notion of who's going to get what once we assume power. Classic electoral sort of spoils divvying up, and that's what I'm hearing from my connections in, in, in, in, in folks in Ankara. Um, the sec... The, the third question, the coup attempt, that's, that's a really good... I mean, I think that's a lot of the reasons why we are here, absolutely. Um, the coup attempt basically exposed the Erdogan and the Gulen movement, right, in terms of you've got two 400-pound guerrillas in the room failing to reconcile their political differences and power struggles, and this just basically turned into an open conflict, right, that, that has not been essentially settled uh, in, in one manner, or another, resulting in a coup attempt, we understand by elements of the Gulen movement as well as elements of sort of, I don't know, renegade, parts of the military, whatever you want to call them. But it's clear it's sort of this big... And I think that's a huge part and part sort of like why we have this centralization of power. If you listen... I'm, sh I'm sure you've seen this because you're, you're, you're a journalist, but um, uh, Ali Babajan on, on the stage in his, in his event the, the other day in, in Turkey, I don't know if you heard his quote, he said, after the coup attempt in 2016... Babajan says that he was told, the entire cabinet was told by Erdogan to burn the dry with the wet, if he, if he translates, you know, translates badly into English, you know, uh, basically saying, go after anybody, I don't care. Let, because if we, take, if we have mercy on people who weren't involved, we're all going to be in a position where everyone's going to feel sorry for us. Take everybody out, as in, like, go after dissidents, opponents, a monumental attempt to basically not just focus on the Gulen movement and hunt them down, but also... It's just a sort of tabula rasa, a sort of fire sale approach to opposition. What's his view of the Western media? I mean, so it's interesting, right? Because he used to give interviews. I've, I've listened to a lot of his sort of old sort of interviews he gave to the Western press in, in, pre in a previous life. But he never engages, very rarely engages with the Western media because, not because I don't think he necessarily distrusts it or, or, or you know, uh, um, or, or, or is suspicious of it, but they ask real questions. Right, and he doesn't want he doesn't want to answer those questions. The only last one he gave, and I was surprised that he gave that, was to to, to public news service in, in the United States, which is their equivalent of the BBC, uh, which was on NewsHour, which is the main news. Uh, uh, so, uh, Judy Woodruff interview he gave, um, he was quite firm on that. Um, but also, when he does give, you know, the foreign press, he's he's not suspicious of them. They want questions in advance. His team wants questions in advance, and most press organizations are not willing to do that. Uh, My question was more along the line. Portrayal as an Islamist leader. Oh, what are your thoughts on that? And do you his portrayal of it. Yeah. I mean, it's part and parcel of the sort of I would say, you know, the, the, the, the New York Times did it with the terror attack the other day. I mean, it's a complete, you know, it, they're, they're only concerned about their own readers, and it's very Orientalist in that approach. And and and you know, they get it wrong, but you know, even the New York Times don't, doesn't get it right. <laughs> Uh, it is an or you know it's it's for a foreign audience and that's all they care about his portrayal you know his portrayal as an Islamist. To be honest, I don't know. I've, I've never thought about that, but um, maybe he would welcome it. Okay, one question here. So behind, a lady behind, and then a question over there. Thanks and if you'd introduce yourself, you're happy to. So my name is Angeliki, and I'm a student um, at LSE, School of Economics, and Master's of Development Studies. Thank you so much for this wide uh, speech so far. My question is regarding um, the integration of Turkey and um, the future of, of it in general. And um, my point is, um, I want to understand further 
the bilateral relation between the UK and Turkey and the lifting of the ban of defence exports uh, since December 2021, um, Rolls Royce producing the fifth um, um, generation of engines for the TFX jets in Turkey. And at the same time, on the other hand, we have uh, Greece pitching to join the F-35 um, program in the US, and at the same time lobbying against the F-16 uh, sales in Turkey. Uh, so one can understand further, of course, observing the aggressive and authoritarian uh, governance of, of Putin, whether these kind of relations, coalitions, um, are in a way maybe sustaining different kind of authoritarian um, character of, of governance in a way, and what that, that mean for the future of, of Turkey, um, not only on the development of, of, the, of its defense, but in general in terms of, of governing. Thank you. Thank you. There was a question sort of here somewhere that I identified before. Yes? Hello. Thank you so much. My name is Esther. Um, I grew up in North Cyprus. The reason I say that is because, you know, pinch of salt for what I'm about to ask, <laughs> because we have a very complicated relationship <laughs> with Turkey. Um, but my question is more related to the role of the private sector. You mentioned that if the opposition comes to power, they have a lot, they have a gargantuan task to clean the public sector. But do you think um, the strategic industries in Turkey, which over the course of the last two decades sort of passed into the hands of um, pro AKP businesses, I'm talking defense like or energy, um, whether the opposition is going to have challenges in terms of cooperating with um, the key players in such industries and whether that might pose a challenge to their electoral success, or indeed what happens to those strategic sectors if the opposition is going to have. Okay, thank you. Do you want to take that? Okay, um, first question. Uh, whether it's sustain whether these sort of arms sales or whatever or the defense industry is sustaining um, the sustain is the sustaining factor of authoritarian governments in countries like Turkey um, sure to a certain extent I, I, I would argue um, uh, I think a historian recently commented that um, that brexit was the, la the single greatest self-harm committed upon the nation state by itself <laughs> if that's the case then then then the, then its defense equivalent is turkey's decision to walk away from the f-35 program i, I mean it, it it was singly it, turkey essentially deserted del taking delivery and being a, a fundamental partner of building this capability which is a strategic capability in preference of a tactical weapon which is the s-400 missile there is no comparison I am sure that if generals in Turkey could talk, who are, you know, who are, who are interested in the modernization of a Turkish air force, if they could talk, they would, like, tear their hair out. I mean, this is simply unbelievable. You know, everybody, including myself, who looked into this, I was until the final minute thinking, this is a bluff. This is not going to happen. I, you know, we were in Washington at the last summit, where, you know, the, the, the bilateral intergovernmental meeting between the Turkish defense industries and, and the American manufacturers, it happened once a year. Now it doesn't happen anymore. Whereby the Lockheed folks who were in charge of the, the F-35 portfolio gave me a long litany of why Turkey was bluffing because of how much it had invested monetarily but also strategically in the, defense, in the development of this fighter aircraft. And then they walked away from it. Now all of this talk from, well, give us F-16s and upgrade kits for our existing fleet, otherwise we're not going to... It's become increasingly antagonistic. But to the heart of your question, it is, I think, one of the main areas of decision-making and policy-making, i.e. this defense space, where, where it is sustaining an authoritarian sort of governance style vis-a-vis -vis partners and allies. I mean, Greece on paper is an ally of Turkey. It should not be, you know, something that it's you know, going tit for tat on. Same with, you know, um, it should not be, the Turks should not be in the business of buying Russian man missile systems, which is identified as a clear threat to the alliance. I mean, it's just not supposed to be something that's happening, but there we are. <laughs> the fighter, the, the engine for the TFX, yeah, I, I'm, I'm holding my breath for that one. Um, yeah, okay. And Greece will take delivery of the F-35. There is no question, which will put the Turkish Air Force in a, you know, 
not just vis-a-vis -vis Greece, but like in the region, not having the F-35 puts the Turkish military at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis any adversarial behavior. It's a fifth generation aircraft that only a certain number of countries have, will have, but also an, an additional damage for Turkey, which the government doesn't talk about, is Turkey was going to be the main servicing area for the F-35 engine from other partner nations that will receive the aircraft, except Israel, because the Israelis do their own maintenance for the aircraft. They don't, they just do their own thing. Um, <laughs> but over a 10 year space, the amount of revenue that Turkey would have taken for F-35 engine maintenance from partner countries would have made neutral its acquisitions for the 100 units that it was gonna buy, and they blew that away. Un unbelievable, just huge, yeah, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, Strategic industries, uh, defense energy. So that, I'll take that as a wider question, but here's how I can answer that for you. We don't know how the Turkish government spends money. We have no access to it as citizens. And, and, and here's what I mean by that. The Turkish government is required by law every year to read out in parliament its spending. Right? Every year, the Sayıştay report would be read out before the Turkish parliament so that citizens of Turkey had a right and understanding, even if a general sense, if they cared about it, to read about how their government's money, being, their taxes are being spent. Those reports have been censored and blocked since 2012. If you go and ask a member of parliament, as a citizen, under a freedom of information request, I would like to know what, how my taxes have been spent, you'll be denied it. No other, in, in, in no other democracy is that acceptable. I, I just do not see that as acceptable. Uh, you know, if the United States, which is a less than perfect democracy at this point, I still have an Enrico, I can go in and request a report of how my taxes are being spent, right? I'm sure you yeah. probably can do that here still. Yeah, we can. So, we can ask. Right. <laughs> so if we get, if we just, you know, forget like the strategic industries, I'm not saying it's inconsequential, but if the opposition takes over government, I think one of the main things you're going to see if, if they have access to the, the books is just how unquestionably uh, and unacceptably public funds have been spent in the last whatever number of years. We just don't have any, we have an inkling into it, but I'm, I, my, my guess is that if we, if we had ever received clarity and certainty, just the, the amount of malfeasance and, and, and, and, and, and sort of shroudedness over public spending is, is, pretty, is pretty bad. Um, but they also haven't been, no opposition member, no one has run Turkey since Erdogan in the last 20 years. So they will have, it, it, it's an upward learning game. In terms of who they sell strategic industries to, I mean, They've sold off so much and privatized so much um, that now, you know, now they're facing sort of search shortages like, I don't know, paper or, you know, the sh Turkey imports sugar now, which, which is just unbelievable, or, or, or grains. I mean, it's just, but there we are. Okay, thank you. More questions. There was one here, certainly, and lady there, and the gentleman at the back. Three. One, two, three. Sir. Talking about Imam, who is good, uh, he is a younger candidate. Uh, but Kılıçdaroğlu doesn't want him to stand. He openly said that. Also, Mansur Yavaş, mayor of Ankara, uh, he said that his intention to stand. And Kılıçdaroğlu asked for the backup openly, his intention to stand. And uh, they give him all the backing. Erdogan won all the elections against Kılıçdaroğlu over the years. He's a politician. He, he runs the campaign really well, and uh, he has been very successful. People of Turkey are fed up because of inflation, because of uh, crisis, and so on. But when it comes to the choosing a president, I believe they will still vote for Erdogan, as they have no opposition, no strong alternative. If Kılıçdaroğlu resign, stands down in the party leader, he, if he gets uh, one of the ex-member Muharrem Ince or Imamoğlu or Mansur Yavaş, opposition will stand a lot more uh, strongly and they would have a more chance. And this doesn't happen. A 
again, Erdogan. Is, is there a question here? Say from this to the question. Okay. Uh, I keep it quite uh, simple. Uh, <coughs> Turkish Air Force and the defense system move forward with the drones. Uh, F 35 blocked by Israel mainly and because Turkey would have a superior power in the Middle East, in the region of Mediterranean, with the F 35. <coughs> Again, they have an alternative. Also, other NATO members got S 400. There wasn't any issue. S 300s. S 300s, not 400. Uh, previous generation. Russian no, system. Uh, yes, really in a way, Russian system. The argument is whether NATO members should have any uh, Russian uh, defense system. Then, taking everything into consideration in here, uh, do you believe that uh, opposition got any chance then? And do you believe Erdogan will lose the election? Also, Tarikas play important role, Black Sea Captain plays important role, uh, not only. Uh, ordinary people going and voting for it. Kurdish vote, 10% guaranteed in every election. Uh, also, some of the Kurdish people vote for AKP. So, that's another thing. Okay. Question here? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Greek. Uh, I'm working in Greece's biggest newspaper, Kathmerini, uh, in the Financial Times in London, and in Greece's biggest think tank for foreign policy. Um, Greece and Turkey are moving along the way of elections at the same time. Uh, just yesterday, the Greek Prime Minister announced that there would be early elections. Um, so there are changes happening in both countries at the same time. Um, in, if there is a change in the government of both countries, so if the opposition comes to power in Turkey and the opposition comes to power in Greece, uh, what are the dynamics going to be? Because we saw uh, when the Greek opposition was in power, there were some interesting dynamics between Greece and Turkey. Um, so if there's a change in that, how is it going to affect the security and diplomatic relations? And how is this going to be translated also in the Eastern Mediterranean in terms of energy, gas, and relations with West Africa? Okay, thank you. Gentleman is back. Uh, my name is Safar Ergun. I'm doing real estate students both in Turkey and in London. Uh, actually, my question is very similar to the, but in a different way, actually. Uh, it, I'm thinking in terms of the election, if you are ruling the, all the playing ground, I'm saying, because Erdogan is ruling the playing ground, and the opposition is willing to play this rule, this game, in this ruling, in, a, in this playing ground, and how it can be possible to a position to a successful. And the second thing is, the opposition is always regretting to speak with the Kurdish people. And it's also, and uh, I have an experience also as well, so I have connected with the EU party, and they are even not speaking with HDP, even, <coughs> not even speaking with Kurdish people. It's really weird when you s regret some of your people in your country, if you are regretting how that can be possible to a success, then this makes me to, to think about that there will be no change. And the country is going one way. And then, then, then there is no alternative of coming over opposition. And what will gonna happen? Okay. Uh, I can these questions together so I mean look you know my advisor and I were talking before my doctoral advisor and I were talking he's less pessimistic than I am and um, I am not altogether I'm not going to stand here or sit here saying it's, it's all doom and gloom and that there is no chance that Erdogan will lose and, and I say this simply because two things one Turkey has a rich history of one way or another elections and elections are absolutely necessary people are demanding of this they respect the ballot box they're jealous of the results of the ballot box you know an uncontested you know determinative result is is in my opinion going to be a determinative result right um i don't know if that will come out as a determinative result though in terms of a clear winner in in in, in, in round one the second thing i will say on it is though if you accept that turkey now is under a 
conventional political science this, the, the definition, an authoritarian government, right, an authoritarian system, right, then authoritarian leaders are, are strongly in power until they're not, right? Um, there is a good you know, literature and a good history of the downfall of authoritarian leaders quite suddenly, right? And we do know that Erdogan fears He's had plenty of example of unceremonious dismissals from power in the last 10 years around him that he fears for the worst. And people have been talking about, like, if the opposition tried to cut a deal with him, give him some guarantees to not sort of, you know, try to stay in power should he lose. He's not going to accept that. He's no verbal agreement. Um, but that being said, I, I, I share to a certain extent your pessimism given the outcome of this election for Erdogan, as it has been in the last few years, is existential. It's not just because he likes being president. I think at this point in 20 years, I don't think he really likes being in the spotlight, just being harangued by the world, his domestic sort of constituents. is just world power. He needs to stay in power, much like some of his contemporaries, like Vladimir Putin, because the consequences of not staying in power are high. Uh, given an inch of independence or discretion, elements within Turkey's judicial system will go after him and his family. There is no doubt. The ship of, oh, he's lost power, they just let him retire as president, you know, let bygones be, that sailed post-Gezi. There is so much this desire for accountability, if I can put it in this you know, very neutral term, is so high in Turkey that you know, no center of power is just willingly to say, yeah, just let bygones be bygones. They want justice, right? Um, that being said, I share your pessimism on the notion of can the op- does the opposition have any... Uh, at this point, I don't see any sort of meaningful platform, as I've said before, of what they can do. Uh, without the Kurds, without engaging positively with, with the Kurds, you know, with the HDP, this doesn't stand a great chance of an, uncon- an uncontested win. They need to sit down... And, and, and be featured with the HDP um, and sort of beat back these notions that, every, you know, the HDP stands for terrorism. That's just, that's just you know. Um, but I should also say that Selatin Demirtas, former prison, is being quite shrewd, right? He's, put a, he's clearly taking a stand against him um, and the HDP's relationship with the PKK, saying we, we don't want to be labeled with this anymore. You know, he's, he's, he's made enemies himself. I think he's also quite shrewd in basically, if it comes down to it, he will point his finger at who he thinks his voters should go for if that, if that is an opposition candidate, even if they don't want to stand, if the alliance doesn't want to stand with, with the HDP. Uh, it, it, so Demirtas is no fool. He's no, he's no, he's no sort of um, weak guy just sitting there, just waiting for things to happen. He's trying to... Um... Yavash is a non-starter. That's why I rule out his candidate, because that is the one candidate, even though he's popular... You know, he doesn't. He's a, he is a nationalist. He was formerly uh, affiliated with the MHP. That's that's a non-starter with Kurdish voters, I would believe. And the other reason why I don't think they want to name Imam Oğlu, which is not inconsequential, is because if you give up Istanbul, the mayor's seat is Istanbul. The new Istanbul mayor will be appointed by the Istanbul uh, Municipal Assembly. The AKP has a majority there. They do not want to lose Istanbul because that's a source of lucrative funds. It's tenders. It's it's it's corruption. <laughs> they do not want to lose Istanbul, a big city that they've won, and that's that's no small feat. So to um, and if they fail, and this is and I, this is where I share your pessimism. You know, Erdogan is the devil that people know, right? If you don't give voters a real reason why to vote for the opposition candidates, you know, what do you stand for then? Just seeing Erdogan's numbers creep up in the past six weeks or so, electoral poll numbers creep up, is to suggest to me that undecided voters, if they're given to, between two choices of an established character, an established president, you know, um, with some notion of governance experience versus this, who is this guy and what are you standing for? Then this is the devil that they know. I, uh, that's the only thing. Um, okay. Yeah, you, I know nothing about Greece and elections. You can feel... Um, but I'm, I'm sure that, you know, like Turkey, I think post-election cycle will be determinative of if Turkey basically ratchet, ratchets down this sort of talk of we will come in the night and take you, you know, all this sort of ridiculous stuff that's going on out there, this antagonizing and threatening behavior. Um, but here's, here, I'm, I'm actually working on a piece that I'm trying to submit, and it's 
day-to-day -day events in, in Turkey are taking care of this. Look, I think if there's going to be a reset with Turkey, not just with Greece and Cyprus, but just the European Union, its relationship with the United States, NATO in general, I think the biggest, this reset for me goes through Cyprus. A negotiated settlement over Cyprus has to occur for tensions to be de-escalated in, in the Mediterranean, for hydrocarbons, natural gas, whatever to be extracted profitably and equitably across the two systems, for Turkey to remove objections to Cyprus becoming a member of NATO, and for Cyprus removing objections towards U uh, Turkey's European adventure, but, in, but even before that, allow Turkey to become a member of the European defense infrastructure if there is going to be one. This, has, this can only come about if Cyprus' conflict is removed off the table. The only mediator I can see that has the gravitas, the power to knock heads together at this point in time is the United States. This is why I'm writing this piece. This is something that the Biden administration should go after, to just knock heads together. It costs them very little political capital, but their gains could be huge. This is all, incidentally, that's the only way I see for U.S.-Turkish relations. There is not a friend in the, in the halls of power in Congress. Would be it in, there used to be something called the Turkey Caucus in Congress, in the House of Representatives, seriously. Hundreds of congressional members that would back Turkey. That, that, that's down to zero, right? The, the, the trust in it, it's gone, right? Um, for U.S.-Turkish ties to be rekindled in any meaningful sense, if the U.S. can broker a deal, which it was successful in doing with the Northern Ireland case, just use its sheer weight of office and power to negotiate, right? I also believe that carries the potential to reignite Turkish-U.S. ties. But that's why I'm focusing on Cyprus now, because until that is settled, none of the, all this other stuff is off the table. And it, yeah, I mean, Cyprus has delimited its maritime borders with, with, with, with um, a bunch of countries in the Eastern Mediterranean. Yes, they've given out contracts to sort of like drilling companies. Some of that gas will be monetized. But if I was an investor and I look at the potential for conflict in the Eastern Mediterranean, will I be interested in that? Is that going to be a major investment for me? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't know too much about energy. But until that lead balloon is taken, that elephant is addressed, right? I think um, other than just like verbally tens tensions being taken down after elections, I still think the problems are going to be there, there underneath. Can okay. I just add something about the... Oh, sorry, I'm not one of the speakers, but I have to <laughs> take an interest in all this. Um, <clears throat> about the Kurdish situation and the, the relationship with HDP. I think the real problem is the relationship with, uh, is the attitude of Meral Arshanev yeah. and e Party, because most of the people in the e Party are formerly Mehape, Milieti Hareket Partisi, which is extremely right wing, ultra nationalist, anti Kurdish. So this, this is the real problem. And the problem arises because of the necessity to change the constitution, right. which they talk about. To change, it's just the, the parliamentary results won't matter that much if there's a presidential system, but they will matter when it comes to the issue of the constitution. Yeah. Because to ca change the constitution, you have to have at least 360 votes in the present makeup of parliament. And yeah. there is a good chance that the opposition alliance could get somewhere around 300, 310, yeah. something like that. But to get 360 will be very difficult. To get to 360, they must have an agreement with HDP. And the trouble is HDP may make demands as a price for this, which Meral Arshaner would reject. Yeah. And Meryl Argenet's party will control, I would guess, somewhere around 60 seats in the next parliament. Are you with me? Yeah. So they're blocked there. They can't change the constitution <laughs> and, uh, because, of the, uh, because of the problem of the relationship with the Kurdish party. Yeah. The second point I would make is, yes, they don't have to have an alliance with HDP in order to win the presidential election. Let's assume that Erdogan fails to get 50% in the first round, which I think is likely. There will then be a second round where the two lead candidates fight a runoff. Do you think that the Kurdish voters are going to vote for Erdogan in the second round? I don't think so. Some of them might stay at home rather than vote. 
uh, for an alliance candidate. Yeah. That's possible. But it's not likely because all the indications are that turnout rates in Turkish elections are extremely high by international summer, uh, standards, somewhere around 85%. So my guess is that, yes, they can win the presidential election without an agreement with the Kurds, but changing the constitution without an agreement with the Kurdish party is going to be very difficult. Sorry to have okay. intervened there. Thanks very much. Uh, three more questions. There's a lady here, I think. No? Right. One there. Uh, one here and one gentleman over there with the beard. Okay, so one, two, three. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, All right, don't go ahead. Yeah. My, my name is Jesse Harrington. Um, my knowledge of economy is very limited. I haven't followed Turkey closely recently, but I was just looking on the internet right now that this is Turkish debt as a proportion of their GDP is only 35.2%. Britain's is 85.4%, Germany 78.7%, France 94.3%. So compared to that, is Turkey really doing badly? And secondly, can, um, can, the, can Turkey, if it gets attacked by anybody, has it got a way of defending itself um, as well? That is, it's, I, I, I'm not a pro Erdogan supporter, but it's, I'm just looking at the figures, and I, I just wanted to have your opinion. Okay. I think I made a mess. There might be four questions. There was one here. Yes. Yeah, so then, then yours, and then gentleman with a beard. Yeah, go on, go ahead. Okay. Uh, my name is Elisa Lugan. I want to ask about so Mayor of Istanbul is such an important stance right now. So Imamoglu may not be going against Erdogan, and Kutaroglu is a powerful stance against Erdogan too. So who might be the next up leader that could win um, in the <laughs> election? Yeah. And what happens if Erdogan does win to Turkey? Like, what's going to possible outcome of this? Okay. Question here. Yeah. So. Um, Hi, I'm a violent extremism researcher. My name is Quinan Chitman, and uh, I was very curious about your paper uh, published yesterday in the National Interest um, about the possibility that the latest Taksim um, attack might have been a false flag operation. And I wanted to ask you, what are some telltale signs that this may have been a false flag operation? And could you elaborate on the domestic and foreign policy gains that were perhaps expected from this uh, event? Um, and perhaps the relationship uh, or the relation of this attack with the elections, the upcoming elections. Thank you. I thought you were going to say you were a violent extremist there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought you were going to say you were violent extremist Which college are you from? <laughs> no, no, you said the University of London. Which university? Which college? No. Okay. All right, so I got a, I think I got a C on my transcript for microeconomics. No, macro I did well in. I think I got a B plus. I was at King's College. So my, my, I didn't know. I didn't know I was actually going to take economics when I arrived as a business major. That tells you how naive I was. Uh, but my, mac my microeconomics was terrible. Uh, so another way of saying, I'm not an economist either. Um, but, you know, my, my, my colleague there basically mentioned one interesting factoid, right? Um, so what I peddle about the economy is based on what I read from economists, right? Which is to suggest that the Turkish economy is not governed, right, at a prudent level, which it previously was. So one indicator of that is things like rule of law, freedom of communication, access to the press, but also the independence of the central bank. Yes. Right, that's gone. Right, we've had how many change of central bank governors in the last four years? Did you, did you give us a number? Four. And they, they usually disappear, or the change occurs on a Friday evening midnight news dump uh, that's tweeted out saying, a presidential decree, the central bank governor, we thank you for their service, you're goodbye, and the new person is somebody you've never heard of and who has no economic credentials to mention. 
So that's a huge problem. But to your point, and, and Bill, you would agree with this, the Turkish economy is actually right now growing, right? Mainly based, I mean, it's mainly export driven. And so that's why Erdogan's saying, that's why he's reducing interest rates, right? He goes, why would I not reduce interest rates? Because if I don't, the businesses that rely on credit will not be able to get credit. It, it will be more costly for them to borrow. That means they can't essentially produce and keep the taps and growth on and employ people. Well, that's fine. But also Turkey, in order to make those exports, imports a ton of raw materials to manufacture its exports. Those come at hard currency costs. So the growth that we kind of see right now is I would, some economists I think credible would say is unsustainable, right? The private, it's not public debt that we should be worried about. It's private sector debt that's becoming unmanageable. Yeah. Yeah. Banks are just lending out credit, which is guaranteed by the state and the central bank. But Turkey is probably reaching a stage where it might not be able to honor those debts because of all this debt that's been racked up. Because the previous crisis was a balance of payments crisis that originated from public debt that was racked up in, in 2001. Right. So it's it's it's it's huge. It's it's huge. Um, public debt and the banking crash. Right. Public debt and the banking crash because of toxic, uh, just bad debts that were written off by Turkish uh, state banks over over decades. So the, the most thing I would say to that, that, that Turkey has economically going for itself is the economic potential is there to have sustainable growth. But that would only occur if political uh, influence was taken out of decision making. And in central bank independence was guaranteed as opposed to, in addition to interest rates being raised up to a, a, a real standard so that the currency could stabilize and people, the, the economic sector could be, could be relatively more predictable. Right now, if you're in a construction sector in, in Turkey, right, let's say you are saying, OK, I'm, I'm going to build an apartment building. I need X ton of concrete. So you go to the concrete supplier and say, OK, I'm, in the next three months, I'm going to need this much supply of concrete. What's the price? The guy will say to you, I will only give you the concrete price for next. Uh, it's good through next week. If you want more than that, you're going to have to come back to me. I will, I will, he's not going to give you a three months. He won't guarantee you a three month price. Right. So prices, um, there is no price stability in the Turkish economy right now. And, and, and it just keeps on. There's no end in sight. Um, what happens if Erdogan wins? That's a really good question. The, so th I've been asking this to so people who bang on about, like, um, they're really saying, well, what's the end state? What, what happens if Erdogan wins? I mean, none of the problems that the country has disappears tomorrow if he re-wins elections. It's not, he doesn't have a magic wand that's going to wave away any of these things. But I, I, I think he's less concerned with that other than, than we're just staying in power. The objective is to stay in power. Why? Because if you're not in power, then people come after you uh, and his family. Um, and he has squirreled away a considerable amount of wealth, we're being told, in bank accounts all over the world outside of Turkey to essentially stabilize his you know, situation should he need to, to, to abdicate. Um, but I can't imagine anything other than basically continue business as usual. I haven't really thought about what goes on because it's, we're also focused about the elections in terms of what happens if he goes. That's why I'm sort of writing this. But other than sort of business as usual, I, I, I, none, none of the problems that, that exist right now that we talked about go away. The approach has to change, but I don't think that's going away either. It's not going to get better. How, wor how worse can it get? Oh, it can get a lot worse. <laughs> Economically, I mean, it can always get worse. Yeah, I mean, th yes. Um, the false flag operation. Right. So I wrote this piece not because I believe fundamentally it's a false flag operation, but the, the whole point about the, about the piece was in the absence of unmolested information or uncorrupted information from the government which should flow, this is what you get, speculation, right? Um, for me, asking just basic questions, and investigative journalists should dig more into this, and they, they do, but unfortunately ones in Turkey are too afraid to ask this, they can't write about it because of the new censorship law, the disinformation law. They will, I mean, you can, you can get in serious trouble for this. Um, we're told that the, the perpetrator of this bomb, uh, the, the bombing attack, the Syrian Arab woman, was trained by the PYD and carried out a bomb. And I said, well, OK, let me just ask a question. The PYD is a Kurdish organization that exclusively advocates for Kurdish causes inside of Syria and has been fighting ISIS for the past whatever number of years. What's in it for her? 
Why would she be? What's the motive for her to carry out a terrorist attack in Istanbul? As an Arab Syrian Arab woman, why does she identify with the Kurdish cause? That's one question. Second question is, the PK the PKK in Turkey has, does not have a long history of targeting civilians or civilian targets in places in, in especially big cities like Istanbul. I'm not saying it's never done it; it doesn't have a pattern of doing it. Right? And also, they're interested in a charm offensive of essentially being recognized internationally as a non-terrorist organization. Why would they do this now? It doesn't, it, you know, things need to be questioned. Um, I would, the PYD has never carried out an attack inside of Turkey. Right? Um, and also, this, the, the, the, what we're being told in terms of information is the person, this person had been living in Istanbul for a year, trained by the PYD in terrorist bomb tactics. Okay. So she's good enough to make a bomb, plant it, and then go back home and wait for the police to arrest her. It doesn't add up. It just... And people are saying, well, you know, why are you sort of, you know, are you... I didn't... I, my, the intention was not to be inflammatory, but just to say, look, we need more answers. This, this doesn't add up. And people are saying, why, why, are you saying, why are you asking silly questions? I said, because in the absence of free information that flows from the press or investigative journalism or the government, it's a national terrorist attack. If we don't have accurate information, then people get to speculate and people ask ridiculous questions. You know, another credible explanation to this, that it's not the PKK. It's likely another jihadist organization, right, that probably has a member, you know, act activists in Turkey, militants in Turkey, that said, so that's another plausible explanation. But again, we don't know. I'm just saying the story that the government has peddled out does not make sense. It doesn't add up. Two plus two does not equal four in this equation. Um, and so that was the main piece. <coughs> Look, who benefits out of it? And this is why, you know, that's a slightly more provocative aspect of the article, or, or some people call it inflammatory. Well, look, everybody right now, we were we've been focused up until now, how bad the economy is, how weak Erdogan looks, Imamoglu could be a strong contender, what about Kulish Tharola, what happens if Erdogan goes down, what if he's... Re when we talk about Erdogan being an election machine, in terms of diverting attention away from something, if this is a manufactured attack then this is exactly what he wanted, the government would have wanted to achieve. To divert attention from, the, from all the bad news here and present a strong leader who can stand decisively against terrorism and provide security for people in Turkey who are naturally angry, afraid, and look for leadership. Right? Um, that's why I wrote it. Not because I think it's definitively a false flag operation, but I think it needs to be asked. Foreign policy-wise, well, that opens up. So that opens up a gate into what happens next. So there are reports coming out from journalists suggesting that Turkey could use this as a pretext for some sort of military offensive into Syria. Um, as revenge, as, you know, obviously, if, you know, they're going to say if that attack happens, it's going to be a hot pursuit. Or the PYD, if it attacks Turkey, if one of your members attacks one of us, we'll attack you, right? But again. Uh, the whole purpose for it, behind it would be to suggest that, you know, strong military response to a terrorist attack, which they attribute to the PYD, right? But there's a problem in that because uh, Turkish military's ability to access Syria is not dependent upon um, its say-so. It would require Russian and likely Iranian acquiescence, and they're not going to get it. So this would be really interesting. Well, they may not get it, that's, um, but that's, that's the foreign policy angle. There was one last question over here, gentleman with a beard. Oh, the central government, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to give you a break. <laughs> oh, the central government one, yeah. The central government one, yeah. I mean, is it right? No, it's, it's, it's the most, I mean, the most surprising thing about this, you know, disappearing central bank governors on Friday dump, news dumps is, you know, 10 years ago, he respected, you know, Erdogan respected the independence of the central bank, as in he, he preserved it. Right? The central bank and all the economists who work there have been, have been pushing quite strenuously uh, to keep interest rates on par with what they need to be, i.e., like the rest of the civilized world, raise them. This, this is the only way you contain inflation. Right? It's not pleasant. It's not pretty. But if he does that, that's going to slow growth. That's going to, you know, you know, they released after 2016, 2017, they actually released a law saying that public, you know, companies are not allowed to declare bankruptcy. I mean, like...
You're not allowed to declare bankruptcy. Well, if you're going out of business, you're going out of business. You can't, right? They went after things like saying if bread manufacturers, like you know, uh, uh, uh, bakers in Turkey, raise the price, then they're going to be investigations after them for like profiteering. A grain of, you know, a sack of of, of flour is imported to Turkey. The flour to Turkey, I don't. It's not manufactured in Turkey anymore because that 10 years ago, the government decided that it was strategically worthless to produce your own flour. So they started importing that from Ukraine <laughs> um, because they found out that soy was more, uh, was more cash uh, uh, lucrative. So Turkey essentially does not have enough grain to, to make bread flour, right? So bakers buy flour at a wholesale price. Well, that's going up. Why? Because it's imported. And the guy said, well, I have to raise the price of bread because otherwise I'm going to go out of business. If I make it for five, I can't sell it for two. No, if you do that, you're going to be investigated for profiteering. Well, what am I, a charity? I mean, like, the, the, the bakers in Turkey are up in arms about this. As in, like, I have to reflect this price on you because I'm paying this much for imported flour. And this can only continue for so long. Right? So another angle to your question is, this is part and parcel of this economic sort of jingoism that has been going on across the board. It's been going on for a while, but my guess is this is time limited. The Turkish central bank reserves are empty. If you look up figures, you will see there a net positive of about $50, $60 billion in the central bank's funds. But those are all currency swap deposits from you know, dollars they've got in place like Saudi Arabia, Russia, Qatar, right? That's borrowed money. That's not real money, right? So there are alarm bells ringing at every level of the economic sort of setup of the country, which they're choosing actively not to listen to. Um, but I'm, again, I, I, su I suspect that that's time limited. It has to be because you can't continue this. I'm going to call the hall there. We're one hour and 45 minutes in. And Sinan has been on show the whole time, and I think that's quite an achievement. If it were me, I'd be now asking for a paid bonus on tax. <laughs> he, as I understand it, at least, is getting nothing for this. No. So I think we owe him a great debt for the, the time that, and, and, and that he spent with us. I really enjoyed his talk. Actually, I enjoyed the answers to the questions even more. Actually, the questions and the answers. I thought it was a good set of questions. Thank you for having me. And um, a good set of answers as well. So I, I personally enjoyed the whole session. Um, you can't really sum that up, um, but I'll try just a little bit. Uh, I'm probably more pessimistic than anybody in this room because I'm more pessimistic than anybody I know. <laughs> um, early on, uh, Sinan mentioned that Turkey is ungovernable. I sometimes think that Turkey is really ungovernable, and whoever gets the power next, I really don't envy them. I think it just looks like a mess. But then I come back to the question about, is everything so bad, really? I mean... Just starting from the UK, we have bigger debt than Turkey. Um, our exports are not going up. Uh, we, um, they have a rate of economic growth. We do not. We are going backwards. Um, so that's just comparing with the UK. If I look longer ago, and I, I used to be accused by my secularist Turkish friends of being pro-AKP, and a little bit I was at the beginning, because I thought that the sort of marginalised parts of the Turkish population needed to be brought into the system. Um, you know, up until then, Islamist parties being banned, Kurdish parties being banned, the military would intervene in politics. Although you didn't have quite the, that kind of control over the institutions you have now, basically the system was dominated by secularists. You know, there was a kind of class, a clan in charge. And I thought the AKP needed to come to power um, to, to, to move Turkey on from that situation. And in those early years, that's what I thought was happening. Um, and when you look at it, if you, you know, when you visit Turkey and you go to Anatolia and you look at the hospitals and the schools and the infrastructure and so on, a lot of people in Turkey are a lot better off than they were. So that kind of hardcore of AKP voters as well as those undecideds who might go back to the AKP, do have material reasons for thinking the AKP has not necessarily done them <coughs> harm, as well as political reasons, that they've been brought into the system, those kind of secular conservative, uh, sorry, religious conservative, provincial Anatolians, 
are now more part of the system than they used to be. Um, and I think all of that's a kind of positive. So I think we do have to retain a sort of balance about where Turkey is. A lot of things are very bad. There's nothing that's in answer that I disagree with. But, but a lot of things are bad for other countries as well. And some things, if you take a longer view for Turkey, have improved for quite a lot of people. So I think we need to bear that in mind. Um, I, um, just to beat my own drum a little bit, again, there was a, um, a special issue on, Turkey, on populism in um, Turkish studies a couple of years back. And I wrote a kind of um, introduction to it. And I said that Erdogan might not be behind the curve, he might be ahead of the curve, that the world is becoming populist. <laughs> and Erdogan, perhaps following Berlusconi in Italy, is setting the tone. I'll go back a little bit on that now, with you know, Trump seeming to be a bit less influential in the state. Opinion surveys going away from Brexit in the UK. Front National didn't win uh, in France. Um, but at the same time, um, things are a mess in Turkey, but wherever I look, things don't look good. <laughs> and I think something else we need to bear in mind is that a lot of Turkey's problems, yes, are self-inflicted, and are, if you like, Turkey's fault. But a lot of its problems are mirrored in other countries as well, or reflect wider global patterns and problems that we all share. So I think bear that in mind as well. I agree with pretty much everything Sinan said, but I also think there's a kind of context hmm. to the mess that Turkey's in. And that maybe balances our view a bit and also applies more universally and encourages me in my native pessimism. Um, anyway, I'll stop there and really express thanks to Sina. I thought it was a great talk and a great session. And thanks to you as well for your um, questions. But I think thanks to Sina. <laughs>